Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 3, Bacterial Pathogenesis. In this module, we're going to go through the host defense mechanisms and the bacterial pathogenic factors which they use to break down our defenses and cause human disease. Welcome to Module 3 for Microbiology. This is an online review for USMLE Step 1 for Falcon Physician Reviews. First, we're going to talk about the factors involved in bacterial pathogenesis. Bacteria have, have evolved a number of features which help them cause disease. We're going to talk about adherence, invasion, the toxins they elaborate, the enzymes they use to cause disease, how they elicit excess inflammation, how they evade our phagocytosis and cellular-mediated immunity, the capsules they use, their resistance to our antibiotics, and how they grow inside our cells. Transmission of bacteria only can come in a number of different ways. They can ride along in airborne droplets, we can ingest them in our food or in our water, or we can get them through sexual contact. We have evolved with a series of natural host defenses which protect us from infection. First and foremost, we have our skin and our mucous membranes which form a physical barrier. Our gut has evolved peristalsis and defecation to eliminate waste. Our respiratory tract has a ciliary action which sweeps the mucus and bacteria out of our pulmonary system and is frequently attacked by bacteria. We have coughing and sneezing which do the same purpose. The urogenital tract has urination to void itself of any waste and we have our body temperature which inhibits bacterial growth. Bacteria on the other hand have a number of virulence factors which are properties which allow the bacterium to overcome the host mechanisms. They have colonizing factors which help them adhere, invade, acquire proper nutrients, evade our immune system and phagocytosis, and they go inside intracellular, intracellularly and have survival mechanisms there. Exotoxins are made by bacteria which damage the host and facilitate infection. Endotoxins activate an inflammatory cascade. Bacteria also have sufficient numbers. If they can get a large enough bacterial load, it can overwhelm our systems. Frequently, bacteria are able to come in under our immune status when we don't have immunity against them and take advantage of us. The first virulence factor we'll talk about is adhesion. This is what a bacteria uses to attach to and stick around its target tissue. Bacteria have different molecules, different proteins in their cell membrane, which will target receptors on their host target tissue. Whether it be respiratory or gut epithelium, or other parts of the body, the bacteria has membranes in its protein which help it go to its target tissue. Examples of adhesion molecules include chlamydia, which uses cell surface lectin to bind to N-acetylglucosamine. Mycoplasma uses protein P1 to bind to sialic acid. Type 4 cholera uses fucose and mannose. And strep pyogenes uses LTA, the M protein, and the F protein to bind to fibronectin. This next slide shows a figure of adherence with strep pyogenes. What you have is the strep pyogenes has its F protein, which binds to fibronectin. It's also called the fibronectin binding protein. You can see these little purple circles have these red triangles, which are supposed to be on their cell membranes, binding to the receptor on the tissue and helping it adhere to it. From there, it can set up its infection. With E. coli, fimbriae are what are used. The type 1 fimbriae bind mannose. And so you have cells with mannose on their cell surface that are targeted by the E. coli. A P. fimbriae, or S. fimbriae, is going to bind galactose, the glycolipids found in the P. blood group. These are glycoproteins. One thing to remember is that the P. fimbriae gives you a UTI, where your P. is made, and the S. fimbriae gives you neonatal meningitis. So different tissue selectivity gives you a different disease. This is a picture of E. coli with its fimbriae. And you can see how this guy, with all its little projectiles, is going to be able to stick onto some tissue and cause some trouble. Extracellular pathogens evade the humoral immune system to prevent extracellular killing. They also evade phagocytosis. The M protein inhibits phagocytosis of strep pyogenes. M protein is found on the cell surface and binds to fibrinogen, keeping it from being phagocytosed. Strep pyogenes also has a C5A peptidase that inactivates the C5A anaphylatoxin, leading to, decreased, de leading to a decreased inflammatory response. Staphylococcus aureus has protein A, 
which binds to the FC portion of immunoglobulin and inhibits phagocytosis. This figure shows the protein A on the Staph aureus as the pink bar binding to the immunoglobulin and the FC region. The phagocyte comes by looking for an FC receptor to pick up, but they're all bound by the Staph aureus. Therefore, it can evade phagocytosis. Bacteria can penetrate, and once they penetrate, they can spread to different parts of the body. Salmonella typhi, Salmonella interreditis, and Vibrio cholerae all can go through the bacteria, through the epithelium, and enter into the bloodstream and cause problems. Lysosomal killing of intracellular bacteria is one of the mechanisms the body has to kill bacteria and keep us healthy. The lysosome intracellularly binds with the phagosome and has a low pH which oxidizes enzymes. Once those two vesicles fuse, the enzymes start and they kill the bacteria inside the phagolysosome. This is cell-mediated immunity and it's important in killing intracellular bacteria. You will be tested on this concept. We'll talk about it more in the immunology section. Some bacteria have developed mechanisms to evade our phagolysosome. Examples of this include Listeria monocytogenes. With Listeria monocytogenes, it has Listeriolysin O, which is a protein or an enzyme which gets activated at the low pH, and it lyses the phagolysosomal membranes, allowing the Listeria to release into the cytoplasm and cause their problems. Other intracellular pathogens have found ways to escape lysosomal degradation. These include Brucella, Mycobacteria, Borrelia, Chlamydia, and Leishmaniasis. IgA proteases are anti-immunoglobulin proteases. They help allow survival on mucosal surfaces. You'll remember that IgA is found frequently along mucosal epithelium and usually gets bugs. And so if you have an anti-IgA anti protease, then you'll be able to evade the immune system. Important bugs which have this include H. flu, pneumococcus, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitidis. Let's do some questions. A 60-year-old male has been in the hospital recovering from a coronary artery bypass surgery. The day after his Foley catheter is removed, he begins to complain of dysuria, frequency, and urgency. Your analysis reveals elevated white blood cells and at numerous gram-negative rods. The ability of this pathogen to cause a UTI is mediated by. So what we have here is a clinical scenario where they've given us clues. We, they don't tell us the bug, but they give us clues about which the most common bug to cause a UTI in somebody who's been catheterized is. And then they ask us what mechanism that uses to, for pathogenicity. So we know that it's E. coli, and we, we know that it uses fimbrae in order to adhere to the epithelium of the urogenital tract and cause problems. A 27-year-old diabetic male presents with a fever and an abscess on his right inner thigh. You drain the lesion and send some of the purulent sample for gram stain and culture. Gram stain reveals numerous gram-positive cocci and clusters. The causative agent utilizes which of the following for pathogenesis? So we have a diabetic who's got an abscess that we've drained. They've given us the gram stain results of the bacteria, and so we know it's a, we know it's a streptococcus. From that, we just need to review which virulence factors they have. We know that protein A is the one that's frequently used. That's what we need to answer this question. Next question. A 24-year-old female immigrant presents with a two-month history of fever, chills, night sweats, 10-pound weight loss, and hemoptysis. Her chest x-ray reveals a 2-centimeter cavitary lesion in the left middle lobe. The causative agent employs which of the following pathogenic mechanisms for enhanced survival? From the clinical picture, we know that we're dealing with tuberculosis, or we should. We've got an immigrant, they've got fever, chills, night sweats, and weight loss, and we've got a cavitary lesion in the left middle lobe. So we know we have mycobacteria. And so we need to think of what mechanisms mycobacteria uses to evade the immune system. And we know that that's evasion of lysosomal killing. When we go through the other answers, none of those are found with mycobacteria. Next question. A 12-year-old girl is brought in by her mother because she has developed a rash and rubbery bumps all over her body. She has had a fever and complains of knee, elbow, and ankle pain, which she states fluctuates. On questioning, her mother reveals that she had a sore throat about three weeks previously that resolved without treatment. She otherwise denies any past medical problems. The causative agent utilizes which of the following for pathogenesis. This is typical of step one. They'll give you a clinical syndrome where they'll give you all kinds of details to help you know what the organism is, 
But then instead of just asking you what the organism is, they ask you which mechanism it uses. So we have here somebody who had a sore throat before, and it looks like they have strep post streptococcal rheumatic fever. So we've got the migratory polyarthralgias, we've got the bumps all over everything with an erythema nodosum, uh, and that, that's what our clinical scenario is. So we know we have strep pyogenes, and we think of the different mechanisms that it has. It doesn't use fimbriae, it doesn't use an endotoxin, it doesn't use protein A, but it does use the M protein. It does not evade lysosomal killing like Listeria monocytogenes does. Pathogenesis of tissue injury. Exotoxins are usually proteins, which act as enzymes for most of the time, and they destroy cellular structures, and they destroy an extracellular matrix. Endotoxins and innate immunity are not antigen-specific responses. Basically, they're just an inciting inflammation wherever they can, and usually it's released on the death of a cell. Specific immunity is antigen recognition dependent, and it gives you specific targeted destruction. An exotoxin, as the question asks, is usually a protein or an enzyme which helps facilitate the pathogenesis of an organism. Connective tissue destruction is what helps the bacteria move around and get to where it needs to and cause problems. Collagenase, hyaluronidase, lecithinase, streptokinase, and streptodornase all help different bacteria move throughout the tissue and establish an infection. Let's wrap up module three. We talked about bacterial pathogenesis. We started out by talking about our own natural host defense mechanisms, including our skin and other, and other anatomic barriers. We also talked about our immune system. Then we talked about the features which some bacteria have which allow them to colonize and then establish disease. They have ways of atta attaching to our epithelium, they have ways of evading our intracellular killing mechanisms, and they have ways of degrading our immune system by IgA protease. Being familiar with these bacterial pathogenesis techniques is key to success on USMLE Step 1.